Next, let's, let's tackle the case of the upper half plane. Recall the upper half plane is just points in the complex plane with positive imaginary part. So the main theorem says, let f be a fractional linear transformation. And it says f maps the upper half plane onto the upper half plane if and only if f can be represented using a two by two matrix that's in SL2R, which just means it has real entries and the SL2 part means it has determinant equal to one. Now let's see why this is true. So here's our proof. Suppose we have a fractional linear transformation f that sends the upper half plane onto itself. Then I claim it sends rp1 onto itself. Uh, notice that cp1 can be broken up into three pieces. The upper half plane identified as a subset of cp1. It can also be broken up into the lower half plane, points with negative imaginary part, and then the rest is just rp1. So now I claim you can show this last part with a continuity argument. I take a point in rp1, and if it mapped into the lower half plane, which is the only other option since f is mapping the upper half plane onto itself, if I mapped into a point with the lower half plane, Basically, I could perturb the initial point and get a point in the upper half plane that maps into the lower half plane, which is not allowed. So we automatically get it's of the form from the previous theorem that A can be represented with a matrix with all real entries. And now let's just look at the condition that f of i maps to the upper half plane. So what I've plugged in here, this is converting to the little f. If you plug i into it, I get ai plus b over ci plus d. And if you compute the imaginary part of that, so you would do that here, you could multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. And when you take the imaginary part of this expression, you base, you just pull out the AD minus BC. So if we're mapping the upper half plane to itself, I is in the upper half plane. So this point that it maps to has to have positive imaginary part. C squared plus D squared is already positive. So you get AD minus BC is positive. And then you can renormalize, let's say, our matrix so that it doesn't have just positive determinant. You can renormalize it so that it has determinant 1 by dividing it by the square root of the determinant. Therefore, every F that maps the upper half plane onto itself can be represented with a matrix from SL to R. Now let's look at the converse. Conversely, if I have a fractional linear transformation represented with a matrix in SL2R, then by our previous material, it has to send RP1 onto RP1. Uh, the computation we already did to compute the imaginary part of FI will show that FI is in the upper half plane. And so we know at least one point maps into the upper half plane, and you could convert this. You could use a similar computation that might be more complicated to show that any point in the upper half plane mapped into the upper half plane, but you can also argue it by a continuity argument. We know one point maps into the upper half plane, and I know we map RP1 onto RP1. If I happen to map a point from the upper half plane to the lower half plane, there'd be a problem because you could connect uh, those two points by a line and then somewhere along the line, you'd have to cross into RP1. So there's sort of a continuity argument which shows that F has to map the upper half plane into the upper half plane. You can argue similarly that F maps the lower half plane into the lower half plane. 
and and that forces f to map the upper half plane onto itself. So that proves the theorem. Let me just make a few more final observations about this result. We should think of the class of matrices involved as not SL2R, but I guess PSL2R. So note, if I have two matrices in SL2R, they're equivalent in PSL2C if and only if one is plus or minus the other. And, and these are the only ways to get non-uniqueness in our representations, again, if we restrict two matrices in SL2R. So we define PSL2R to be what you'd guess. You take equivalence classes in PSL2C, but you restrict to A in SL2R. Now, finally, just some notation. We'll call the automorphism group of the upper half plane the set of fractional linear transformations that sends the upper half plane onto itself. And so the theorem we've just proved shows that this automorphism group is isomorphic to PSL2R. One way to give a description of the fractional linear transformations that send the disk onto the disk is through the Cayley transform. And we may as well use this as an opportunity to prove some things we've claimed before about the Cayley transform. So here is the formula for it. I guess there are many transformations that go by this name. Basically any map that sends the disk onto the upper half plane will work. So there are lots of variations or someone might refer to the inverse as the Cayley transform. In any case, we claim that this map sends the unit disk. So that's my notation D. sends the unit disk onto the upper half plane. And to prove that, I only actually need to look at a handful of points. So notice uh, one maps to infinity in this map, and i maps to minus one, and minus one maps to zero. And I claim you can use that to show that c maps the unit circle onto RP1. Why is that? Well, the unit circle is a circle. Fractional linear transformations send them to lines in CP1. Uh, and I know that these three points are on that line in CP1. And I've shown that through any three points, there's a unique line in CP1 going through them and rp1 goes through these three points. So we have to send the unit circle to rp1 under this map. Now you plug in zero and get i, so c sends zero into the upper half plane, and then we make another continuity argument to show that we map the unit disk onto the upper half plane. You could also argue using connectedness, but in any case, the point is, if I had a point in the disk that mapped to the lower half plane, then you'd have a problem if you connect that point to zero on a line segment somewhere on the line segment, C would have to map into RP1, and that would be a problem because it only sends the unit circle to RP1. You could make a similar argument for the complement of the closed disk within CP1 that it has to map into the lower half plane. So we get from this that the Cayley transform maps the disk onto the upper half plane. And you also get kind of an isomorphism of automorphisms. Automorphisms of the disk would refer to fractional linear transformations that send the unit disk onto itself. And this will be isomorphic to automorphisms of the upper half plane via conjugation. You send F, an automorphism of the disk, to C inverse f c and you'll get an automorphism of the upper half plane and you can easily reverse this map so this gives one description of the automorphisms of the disk but we're going to go on to give a more concrete description 
that is useful in going back and forth between the two worlds of the disk and the upper half plane. 